Hello, everybody. Welcome to the um, uh, Government of Canada Office 360 count, 365 Council. Today, we're going to do a presentation on the CDIC journey to Office 365. Appreciate uh, everybody joining us all across Canada. This has been absolutely fabulous. We could go to the next slide for me. I thought uh, my name is Barry Doucette. I'm the CEO of Orangatech and the chair of the GOC Office 365 Council. I thought I'd take a moment to let everyone know what the council's about because we've got a lot of new members since we went live on the internet in April. We founded the council in June 2018. This is now our third beginning of our third full season, and this is our 22nd presentation. The Government of Canada, Government of Canada Council is planned and presented by Orangatech. Really, this is what we've considered kind of in some ways our civic duty. Uh, can we go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. We have asked many departments to present to us and to everybody on this, on the internet here and on our seminar, their department's journey to Office 365. We ask, tell us about your vision, tell us about your implementation, your plans, your challenges, lessons learned. We all know that's where there's a lot of good learning there and successes, of course. And we've had some absolutely fabulous presentations over the, over the last two years, we've had, as an example, City of Ottawa, we've had ICED, we've had Treasury Board a couple of times, SSC a couple of times, Invest in Canada, CMHC, Transport Canada, D&D, and CSC to name that. When we started in 2018, we really had about 17 people around the table with eight to 10 departments. That was uh, through 2018. In January of 2019, we had CSC present and we had 100 people want to attend. So we set it up at the Microsoft office. And since then, we've been having between 70 and 100 people attend these sessions. Over the years, everyone kept saying, Barry, can we do this live? I've always really believed in having people show up. But you know, sure enough, March came, we all went home, and we've been doing this uh, since April live, and it's been absolutely fabulous. I'm sort of kicking myself for not having done this sooner. Uh, it's absolutely great. We have you know, over 250 people dialing in across Canada and listening. So ask everybody if you can to you know, put away all those emails and all your phones and, and uh, take the time to pay attention. Our next one's already set up. It is October 29th. Mr. Phil Keast, the director of the Joint Defense Cloud Program at Department of National Defense. It'll be set up at 1.30 on the 29th and we'll be sending invitations out again on Tuesday. Uh, Phil is a great presenter, really don't want to miss it. Next slide, please. For today's presentation, we're using Teams Live. Uh, it's, you know, what it really means is we have the ability to really listen. No, over 250 people can join Teams Live. The presenter can present. Please submit questions, and then we will publish those questions. The more votes a question gets, like it, say I'd like to have that question answered, we will ask those questions at the end of the presentation. We prefer that you identify yourself, both your name and your department would be great. Uh, anonymous questions may or may not be asked, but definitely ones in which you identify yourself would be really worthwhile. To, to kick this off today uh, from CDIC, we have Omar Watt, who is the Manager of Information Governance. Omar, over to you, sir. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I want to start by uh, giving a little bit of context um, about this project. So we have begun to think about this uh, project about three years ago. Uh, in the beginning, it was a migration project from SharePoint 2010 to SharePoint 2016. And while we were looking at upgrading SharePoint, uh, the IS team, which is our IT team, uh, had started their cloud migration and already had a Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, which includes uh, SharePoint Online. So we began to have discussions with IS and the uh, idea of doing the, the big leap from SharePoint 2010 on-premise to SharePoint uh, Online started to gain some ground. Um, when we decided to do the big leap, uh, we quickly understand that if we are to do it the right way, we need to expand the, the scope and stop uh, considering this project as a SharePoint, uh, quote unquote, just a simple SharePoint migration project, but um, as a more significant Office 365 migration project, which means 
including and focusing more on other aspects such as security, external sharing, data loss prevention, sensitivity labels, MCAS configuration, and change management and training, as opposed to just uh, information governance and records management. And this is when we decided to engage Orang Tech to deliver the uh, roadmap of the migration from SharePoint 2010 to Office 365. Uh, this roadmap helped us better articulate our vision, objectives, and the scope of the project. Um, we wanted to uh, effectively manage CDIC information assets, uh, provide uh, controlled access to records and documents from a centralized location, uh, automate retention and disposition, uh, increase the effective searching, and also protect uh, employee and customer personal information from security breaches and unauthorized use. So we kicked off the project officially in November 2019, but in practice, we started in January 2020. Uh, since then, uh, things are progressing very well. Uh, more than half of the half of the organization has been onboarded and is now uh, using SharePoint Online and Office 365 apps. Uh, the project is on time, on budget, and we've received uh, good feedback so far about the whole onboarding process. Uh, this is mainly because we, and uh, when I say we, it's uh, Orang Tech and CDIC, um, we were able to adapt the process uh, based on feedback received, especially during the pilot. Uh, for example, when we decided to do the first kickoff sessions uh, with the site champions only, uh, given their essential role, uh, but after the pilot, we agreed that it would be better to invite the, the entire team to those meetings. Um, so uh, we were looking uh, for uh, expert guidance and Orang Tech indeed provided this expertise. Uh, we, we have an excellent work relationship and work more as partners. Uh, the Orang Tech team is very strong, uh, knowledgeable, uh, has a lot of experience and it shows throughout the project. Uh, we rely on them on major questions and nine times out of 10, they provide us with the right answer. Um, my director told uh, told me the other day that uh, this is the the best partnership he has uh, ever had with a vendor, and and I, I really echo that. So uh, before I turn to Ian for the presentation, I wanted to quickly share some success factors. Uh, I know Ian will uh, share more details on his presentation, but one uh, having executive support and engagement is critical because this type of project uh, requires a considerable commitment from the employees. So uh, having our CEO as the sponsor of the project was a big win for us. Um, number two, uh, have a robust change management and training strategy, as well as ongoing support because uh, tools and features in the cloud change frequently and you want to keep up with the change to reinforce and maintain user adoption. Uh, and number three, uh, make uh, IM and IT work together. Uh, when I started to work at, uh, with CDIC, uh, the IG information governance team and the IS team were under different directors. And that's one, the, one of the reasons why when we were working on the SharePoint on-premise upgrade, uh, while our IT uh, team already purchased the SharePoint online through a Microsoft Enterprise Agreement. So after reorg, uh, both uh, IG, uh, IS, but also uh, the service sec team were grouped under the same director. And this helped us to break silos and work as a team with more regular meetings, et cetera. And for CDIC, it was uh, really e essential to have those key players working as a team from the very beginning of this project. So those were the main key success factors I wanted to share. So. I think um, uh, I will uh, I will turn to Ian for for the presentation. Thank you. I'm going to do the introduction again. It's Barry Doucette, and thanking everybody for joining us. And I'll introduce Ian. Um, Ian's been a senior senior IT consultant, 20, 20 plus years in information technology. He's been a program manager, ten years in information management, particularly on SharePoint and Office 365. As you can see from some of the slides here, or some of the um, clients that, that Ian's worked with, there's been very large uh, clients, Toronto Transit Commission, SickKids, uh, Nova Scotia Power. So some very large clients that, that he has worked with. 
And uh, using all that knowledge and, and all that experience is really what we felt has been very successful with CDIC. If you're new and joining us, I just want to make the point that, you know, we have done 22 presentations, as I've mentioned. Three, a lot of those clients are Orangatech clients or a lot of those departments. But when they do their presentations, it's not always Orangatech that has implemented it. Today, Definitely, Orangatech has helped CDIC, as Omar has mentioned. So this will mention uh, Orangatech a few times. Just so everybody know, we've always attempted not to be a marketing platform. This is not a marketing platform. And I believe, stick to it and you'll listen to and hear some great uh, information. Over to you, Ian. Thanking everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Barry and Umar, for the introduction. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the CDIC journey to Office 365. I'm going to give you some background on why they wanted to move to Office 365 and talk about how we delivered each work stream, security and compliance, internet, SharePoint online migration, and information management. We'll leave some time at the end for questions and answers. So without further ado, let's jump into the background. When I first engaged with CDIC, they had provisioned an Office 365 tenant. They had synced their Active Directory users and migrated to Exchange Online. For document management, they had a mix of SharePoint 2010 sites and shared drives. Sending and keeping documents and email attachments was also a common user behavior, especially when working with external guests. Skype for Business was a tool of choice for instant messaging and virtual meetings, and their intranet was being hosted on SharePoint 2010 with custom info platforms, workflows, and other solutions that couldn't be directly migrated. These technologies were coming to end of life <clears throat> and CDIC decided to address this risk by moving them to Office 365. Other technology goals included improving how users collaborate, such as how they share content both internally and with guests, how employees draft documents, manage versions, comments, feedbacks on approvals, maintaining a single source of record. CDIC was also focused on cybersecurity best practices and ensuring that sensitive content was secured in a cloud environment. They wanted a better approach for their records management and a new internet with centralized content and an enterprise navigation. These goals were exciting. CDIC was all in on Office 365 and I couldn't wait to get started on the project. However, it was identified early on that we had concerns with IT sponsoring a project with major business impacts across the organization. How would we secure the support that we needed? To address these concerns, CDIC took the time to engage and educate leadership so we could get their support. To do this, we delivered presentations at the Senior Leadership Council and met with leaders individually to address any concerns. We wanted to set realistic expectations and ensure that each department had resources dedicated to this project. We didn't want to be competing with conflicting priorities that could cause project delays and impact budget. A big win early on was we were able to secure the CEO as the project sponsor. This ensured we had visibility and sway not only as IT, but across the entire organization. We also secured directors and managing directors across the organization to participate in our monthly steering committee meetings. We use these meetings not only for project updates, reviewing risks and decisions, but to also do a show and tell on Office 365 and our progress. This engaged leaders often, raising awareness and excitement for the project. In addition to the technology goals, CDIC had a vision to create a new information worker. This would require a focus on changing current user behaviors. Key goals were to promote Office 365 applications and best practices, such as using OneNote to replace paper notebooks, take advantage of SharePoint collaboration features, such as version control, co-authoring, and sharing links over attachments, moving away from folder structures and tagging files with metadata, and changing user tendencies to store convenience copies and keep information for themselves. CDIC wanted to open permissions by default and only lock down content that truly required it. These goals and concepts led us to create an enterprise project called the Modern Workplace. This name was important because it reflected not only the technology deliverables, but also the people impact required to shift their user behaviors and how they use technology in a modern workplace. 
we continually communicated and used the modern workplace concepts to raise user awareness and to prepare them for the change. The project was broken down into four work streams. Security and compliance would ensure Office 365 was configured to support the project vision. We viewed this as a foundational piece that we wanted to have in place before any live implementations. The existing intranet wasn't being properly governed outside the communication team. Departments tended to put important information such as policies, forms, and updates on their own sites. This meant employees had to know exactly where to go and bookmark these pages to find the resources they needed. CDIC envisioned a centralized internet with an enterprise navigation to help tie the modern workplace together. Migrating to SharePoint Online would be the largest work stream for this project, require rebuilding SharePoint team sites for every department based on the modern workplace vision. Simply migrating their existing sites or doing a lift and shift would not give CDIC the benefits they were looking for. In addition, solutions such as InfoPath Forms, 2010 Workflows, and other custom solutions cannot be directly migrated. The Information Management Workstream would focus on managing information from with an enterprise perspective. We wanted to drive the correct user behaviors for a modern information worker and provide the tools to help them do it. This included identifying types of information and what 365 applications should be used, defining enterprise metadata for a consistent approach, such as taxonomies for vendors, members, fiscal year, and document types, deploying a document and record management lifecycle that would be simple for users, and providing governance and operational guidelines to help CDIC sustain their vision. With the vision set out by CDIC, we knew change management would be a critical component to this project, especially when it came to creating the modern information worker. As I go through each work stream in detail, I'll be highlighting our change management approach and deliverables to give you an idea of what we did. Let's take a closer look at what we did for security and compliance. This work stream started with an assessment of the current 365 settings and providing recommendations that would structure our foundation. We decided to group our recommendations as a three tier security model. Baseline protection would be applied across the entire tenant for all users. This included controls for privilege accounts or administration account, for users logging in from untrusted location, in other words, guests or employees using their own devices, implementing Microsoft's advanced threat protection for safe attachments and links, and setting up alerts and monitoring for the cybersecurity and IT operation teams. The increased protection tier is where we would enable security controls for sensitive information, external guest access, data loss prevention, permission controls for SharePoint sites, and policies for Teams, SharePoint, and OneDrive. The highly regulated tier was focused on defining administration roles and responsibilities so we could put access controls in place for the Office 365 administration portals. Given the time constraints for this presentation, I can't go into detail on each of these items, but I am going to select a few key components that I think might be of interest. Within Office 365, organizations can decide how they want to control sharing of content with external guests. You can allow anonymous access, let employees add their own guests, restrict sharing to only guests in your directory, or disable it completely. If employees aren't allowed to collaborate with external guests within SharePoint, they'll resort to other methods such as file attachments or Dropbox. At that point, the organization has lost visibility or control over this content. Our focus was to change user behaviors and to have a modern workplace. Therefore, CDIC wanted to allow guests but have some control so they weren't putting themselves at risk. We opted to leverage Azure B2B and require that guests have an identity in that directory before employees can share content with them. This would keep guest accounts separate from employees, but offer controls for audit, monitoring, and security policies. To work with external guests, employees must first request that the guest is added to the CDIC directory. They are then able to share sites, libraries, and files the same they would an internal user. <clears throat> With guests added to Azure B2B, CDIC was able to apply a policy 
forcing guests to use multi-factor authentication. Guests can receive a text or phone call, but CDIC promotes the Microsoft Authenticator app. This app is installed on guests' cell phone, and after a one-time setup, will provide them with a pop-up to approve logins. CIC was approved to store up to protected B information within Office 365. However, they didn't want to open this for employees until they had a high confidence that their sensitive information would be protected. We decided to tackle this by applying multiple controls. The first control was user awareness. We realized that many users were not familiar with the security classifications or able to determine when to apply them. We therefore put a focus on managing sensitive, sensitive information during training and provided additional quick reference cards and support on the topic. We also wanted to educate users on SharePoint permissions. In addition, we created a site champion network who received additional training and higher level access to the sites. The champions were tasked with performing external guest access reviews on a regular basis. The next control was to identify the type of information stored on SharePoint sites and based on their sensitivity, change how content can be shared. For public sites, members can share the site, libraries, and files. If a site is private, members can share files, but only site owners can share the site. For confidential sites, <clears throat> only site owners can share the site, libraries, or files. The next control was creating sensitivity labels that would be available to users to apply to documents such as public, protected A, or protected B. This label would apply a visual marker, letting users know that this document contains sensitive information and also encrypts the document, allowing only specific users to read it. The last control was to enable data loss prevention policies which are constantly searching CDIC sites and documents, looking for any patterns of sensitive content. For example, credit card numbers, social insurance numbers, personal or customer information. The policy will put a red symbol next to the documents informing the user that sensitive information was found. It can also restrict the sharing of these files with external guests. Internet Workstream started with establishing a new internet working group. In the past, communications team had the highest engagement as they were responsible for posting news and events. Therefore, they became the de facto owners of the internet. And while they did a great job on communications, the other areas often lagged behind. CDIC wanted a different concept for the new internet where all departments would have responsibility to post and maintain content. The Internet Working Group was therefore comprised of representatives from across the organization, such as IT, HR, finance, legal, and communications. Their job was to help identify key content and resources that would make the Internet an effective employee tool. It also provided a forum to discuss ideas and concepts driving a consistent approach. In addition to the Internet Working Group, CDIC also engaged with a graphics company to help with the design. We had a few basic guidelines that we had to follow. Only out of box was allowed. We could create as much custom graphics and branding as we wanted, but it had to work with the out of box Office 365. Navigation had to be simplified with fewer levels, a flatter structure, and consistently applied across all the sites. It must be bilingual and it must be sustainable. In other words, CDIC resources should be able to easily maintain and mature the content. CDIC already had a lot of content, forms, and custom solutions on their existing internet and scattered around numerous sites. It was determined that the internet would be established as a new source of record for any content that should be consumed by CDIC employees. SharePoint team sites would be for document management only. An inventory was created of all the existing content and put into an online card sorting tool. Then we used card sorting exercises to determine what content would be kept, to collect new ideas, and determine how it should be organized. 
the card sorting exercise was a critical step as it allowed stakeholders to provide their own examples on how they thought the internet should be structured. The results showed patterns and themes that were relevant to CDIC employees and culture. From these results, we're able to narrow the structure down to a few options where we built proof of concepts that were discussed in working groups to establish the final design. I'm gonna take a few minutes now to show you what that looks like. What we're looking at here is the CDIC internet homepage. You'll notice that the colors and theme are not the out-of-box Office 365. <coughs> Excuse me. These are CDIC colors, and this is very easy to do using out-of-box settings. You can define your own theme inside Office 365 and apply it to the sites. And this theme is applied not just to the internet site, but to all the SharePoint document management sites and cross-functional sites within this tenant. And that way employees feel that there's a common theme and it's all part of the same company. The other thing we did was that we rebranded the internet to uh, the name Connections. And this was important because <clears throat> the, the other internet had been around for many years and has had varying success with SharePoint and SharePoint 2010 and different employees felt uh, different ways about those solutions. And so when we were launching the new modern workplace for the information worker, we wanted to step away from any past uh, thoughts or behaviors. And so we named it Connections, which really means that this is the hub that connects all the team sites together. And to show you that, up at the top here is an enterprise navigation. The first link over here is to Connections. So no matter <clears throat> where you are in the system or what document management site you're on, you can always click this and get back to the home page. Team sites here are show users an org structure. So this is uh, CDIC's top level areas, uh, which all the departments kind of fold into. And as an example, I've expanded the corporate governance and stakeholder affairs to show the departments within this group. And so as a user, I can easily get to any document management site for the departments. And remember, <clears throat> we wanted to break down silos and have a default open permissions and only lock down content that's, that was absolutely necessary. And so as users go through this, they can actually go and collaborate and work with their coworkers and jump between these different teams. The next top enterprise navigation is the cross-functional sites. And these are some of our centralized portals that we created, uh, such as the contracts portal. And so when we were onboarding departments, we discovered that many of the departments were keeping their own convenience copies of contracts. And they weren't really the source of records for contracts, but they needed to refer back to them in, in certain conversations and work. And so we decided to create a centralized contracts portal and open up permissions to uh, managers and directors and, and administrators who required access to it. And by centralizing it, we also applied metadata to help organize it and make it easy for departments to find the contracts that they were uh, interested in. Other portals were Leadership Council, Parliamentary Questions, and ATIP, and Member Portal, which is one of the main functions for CDIC. I'm actually just going to pop quickly back to the home page and talk a little bit about the content here. And so on the internet, it has its own top navigation, which you'll only see while you're on the internet. This enterprise navigation up here is always here regardless of where you are in the tenant. In the center here are where CDIC displays their top news stories. And these news stories come from many different categories. And this is kind of your daily snapshot of news that's happening around CDIC. And over on the right here are for important dates and upcoming events. And if I take a look at uh, the top now for the internet, under what's happening, employees can go and look at different categories under news and events. And so if they're interested in looking at just news stories about COVID-19 or maybe past news stories that aren't showing up on this homepage, they can go into here. Or messages from their CEO, project updates, or building and facility updates. Let's take a look at COVID-19. So this is what these landing pages look like for each of the news stories. They have a picture and a graphic and, and some text, some explanations to what the page is, and then it has each of the stories uh, that's been posted based off of this topic. 
We're using all out-of-box modern web parts to create uh, this website. There's nothing custom in here. If I continue on to the next one is employee resources. And the point of this section uh, well, is to provide the resources or tools that employees might need to, to perform their job at CDIC. And so we have finance guidance, information, corporate policies, which you see I've expanded here. So it has showing the policies based off a topic. We have facilities and business continuity and audit. Just to show you what the facilities one looks like. This is, they have org charts, meeting spaces, locations, floor plans, and BCP plans. An example of what these pages look like, if I went into the finance guidance page, <clears throat> again, this is using all out of box web parts. We have important information for employees such as general expenses, how to submit a general expense claim, uh, guidance for overtime meals, training expense and hospitality. And if you scroll down this page, you would see other tools or financial guidance for employees. On the right here, we put this bar with relevant contacts and you'll see this as a theme when I start showing you the document management sites and the, and the team sites. We, we always use this right bar uh, that's colored in order to point out some, some easy links and people you can reach out to. Uh, maybe other information that might be relevant to the page that you're on. Another example of uh, the page is the meeting spaces, <clears throat> and we're using a document web part here to actually show the contents of the document, and employees can see the meeting rooms, the floors that they're on, uh, the min and max participants, and whether it has audio and visual. And again, this right bar shows the contacts and people that you can reach out to should you need to. Under people and culture, we have information uh, for working at CDIC so people can get into their employee portal, look at their rewards, uh, the growth uh, is around their, their learning path and career development, and one in life at CDIC is about uh, CDIC culture and events. Under board and leadership, we have things like the Leadership Council key takeaways. So when the Senior Leadership Council is done, they have a key takeaways document that, that's set up and that's posted on the internet for employees to read with their dates. So you can always come here and look at those. That's about uh, everything I wanted to show for the internet. So I'm gonna shift gears now and talk a little bit about the SharePoint migration. So the focus for this deliverable <clears throat> was to move off on-premise SharePoint 2010 and share drives. However, CDIC didn't want to do a lift and shift. They wanted to change how documents and information was being managed, and this meant a complete overhaul on the sites. So to achieve this goal, Orangutec developed a repeatable methodology to onboard each department. The methodology required each department to identify two site champions that will work closely with the project team throughout the onboarding. So let's take a quick look at that methodology and I'll highlight some key points. The first phase was orientation, which we time boxed at four weeks. Uh, as I'm going through this chart, you'll see the expected duration here. These colors represent different roles. So the site champion, the purple, is the task that we expected them to perform. The SharePoint administrator, our records manager, and down here is others, such as our change manager. <clears throat> so the orientation, we time box of four weeks, and the purpose of this phase was to kick off the onboarding process with leadership and site champions. In this kickoff, we explain the process, roles and responsibilities, set expectations, and timelines. The other goal for this phase is for the records manager to work with the site champions to complete what we called an onboarding worksheet. The worksheet captures the information that this group is responsible for. It also highlights how they'd like to organize it, metadata, the sensitivity of the information, who should have access, and it also gets their perspective on possible transitory information versus business records. This worksheet really sets the foundation for the rest of our onboarding process. Phase two is discovery. An experienced SharePoint BA will go over the worksheet with the site champions to better understand their business, ask questions about the organization of content and metadata, and apply best practices and recommendations in architecting their SharePoint site. This will lead into the analysis phase. The SharePoint BA will start designing their site on paper. The purpose is to apply information management best practices along with the modern workplace vision to land on a final design. 
SharePoint BA might also enlist the help of our developers to build any custom forms, workflows, or power apps required for that group. With the analysis complete, the BA and developer will start building the site. And this includes the navigation, libraries and lists, metadata, custom forms, and workflows. And at the end of this phase, the business analyst will demo the fully functioning site to the site champion for feedback. If everything is okay, we move into the migration phase, which we time box to two weeks. We chose to time box this phase because we wanted the business areas to focus on migrating their critical content only. With all the historical content on shared drives and SharePoint, the onboarding process would drag on if we tried to migrate at all. So the purpose is to get the group up and running on their new SharePoint site and following modern workplace best practices. Their old content will still be available on the shared drives and SharePoint 2010 for reference when needed. To kick off this phase, <clears throat> we meet with the site champions to train them on how to identify their content and tag it for migration. We also provided them with a report on duplicate files, age of content, and when it was last accessed. And this helps each group determine what they want to migrate. And to help process the migration, we purchased a tool called ShareGate that would flatten their folder structure, maintain version history, and auto-populate some metadata. It also provides Excel files to end users so they can easily tag their files with metadata before migration. When migration is over, we start the one-week validation phase, which is facilitated user acceptance testing. We walk the stakeholders through their site, metadata, migrating files, and permissions to ensure they are happy with the results. And at the end of this phase, we require sign-off from the director or managing director, allow us, allowing us to move forward with the go-live. The go-live phase is when we train both end users and site champions on how to be modern information workers. We kick off the training with virtual sessions to highlight some key points and to teach users how to use our self-led training center where employees can complete the training at their own pace. At the end of the training is a quiz which all employees must complete and get a passing grade before they'll be given access to their new site. This is important because their shared drives and SharePoint 2010 sites will become read only one week after go live. We made this decision to drive adoption, to simplify users' document storage options, and to also reassure users that they can still access their old content. The final phase is the post go live, <clears throat> where each group will get continued support from the SharePoint BA who built their site. We also check in one month, three months, and six months post go live to ensure the group is happy and there aren't any gaps. Throughout this entire onboarding process, our change manager has uh, identified communications that happen within each of these phases. And so we had these canned communication messages that went out at the start of each phase and at the end of each phase. And we sent this out to leadership for that department, the site champions and users. So they were constantly, they attended the kickoff, so they knew what the process was. They knew what the timelines and resource expectations and then we constantly communicated with them through each section so that there was no surprises. They knew what was done and what was coming up. With a repeatable methodology defined, <clears throat> we wanted to test our process with a pilot group. We wanted a realistic pilot that would provide feedback on the entire experience. Therefore, we wanted to have our security and compliance configuration completed and all of our communication and training content ready for the pilot. The training and communications was done in English only so we can minimize the rework after we received feedback. For the rest of the organization, we grouped departments into waves based on their size, similarity of function, and we also looked at any blackout periods based on workload. <coughs> because of the repeatable methodology, we're able to create a rigid schedule that would keep us on target and within budget. One last thing I want to show you before we move on is our training center. We built a lot of custom content. We're quite proud of this work. It's received amazing feedback and it was a critical component of our, of our uh, success. So this is what our training center looks like. And each everything in the training center is broken down into modules. So what you're looking at here is module one, the modern workplace. 
and it's really laid out kind of like a skill path that users have to go through. So the modern workplace here has three videos. It's about nine minutes to complete it. And really, this is all about user behavior changes. So it says, OK, what, what is this modern workplace and information worker? Uh, why do we want to use metadata over folders? Uh, what is co-authoring? And, and other concepts that we're really trying to get through with our modern information worker. If you scroll down the path and continue down the page and continue on the skill path, we introduce the Office 365 apps. Then we talk about working with documents, the basics, working with documents beyond the basics, how to find things, OneDrive for Business, Microsoft Teams. At the end of the skill path, we have to take a quiz. And again, as I mentioned, this quiz um, is required in order to get access to your site. So I'm just going to show you briefly what uh, one of those uh, packages looks like. So if you went into the modern workplace, one, what's a modern workplace? This is an example of what we did. And <clears throat> so we created custom content here specifically for CDIC because uh, they had very uh, clear vision and goals as to what they wanted to implement and also the behaviors they wanted their users to have. And so this is hosted on stream. Uh, it's in English and French and it has transcripts as well. Uh, over here we explain what it is and we include any related materials to that video. An example of another one would be if you wanted to introduce in the Office 365 apps, we have, we're showing the hamburger menu, we're walking through the, the apps, we're explaining to users what they're for, what they're not for, things like that. And if you scroll down that page a little bit more, we actually have more content for each apps. And so this is kind of like a, a cheat sheet, it's like fun facts about it. So here's SharePoint, what do you use it for? What do you not use it for? And three fun things you can do with SharePoint right now. And then we have a video overview of SharePoint and a quick reference card here. And same thing for Stream and all the other apps, so on and so forth. At the end, this is the quiz. I just wanted to give you uh, give you a look at what it what it what it is. And really, this is fairly basic questions, but it's enough to kind of let us know if people went through the training or not. And so, if they are able to pass these questions. Uh, then we give them permissions to their new site. OK, <clears throat> I'm going to show you uh, what a document management site looks like. So after we we're done the onboarding process, uh, this is kind of uh, what we have. And so starting from the connections home page, I'm going to navigate. I'm going to go to strategy and risk management to the ERM site. And when you get to the site, this is kind of what, what it looks like. And this is a standard template for all of our sites. Uh, one of my pet peeves is in older versions of SharePoint or even online, people will create sites but leave the default site either empty or some information that doesn't apply or makes sense. And so site champions who are running this site have the option to change this content. But from day one, we put two web parts on this site just so it's not blank. So we have recent documents. And this has to do with the user that signed in. So these documents could be on OneDrive or different SharePoint sites. It's related to the recent documents the user uh, opened. And same thing with my recent site. So they can add quick links to some of the recent sites that they're visiting. Over on the right again is that purple bar and we're saying who's your site champion. <clears throat> the reason why we want to advertise this is because they're actually the first level of support for our users. They sit in your department. They understand your business and how it operates. And so as a user, if you have a question, sorry, and they also were a part of building this site, uh, determining the libraries and the metadata. And so as a user, if you have a question about your site or need permissions, help with permissions or something like that, then you would reach out to this person first. Over on the left here, we have some headings. And so we grouped, uh, if a department had numerous uh, libraries, we'd group them under, uh, uh, under headings. And so <clears throat> I'm going to go into the reference library heading and go into the training library. So this is what the modern experience looks like. It's quite different from SharePoint 2010. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lot better user experience. So I'll just quickly kind of show you. Uh, this is a flat structure. You'll notice there's no folders. And I'm going to kind of walk you through metadata. But you can see here has a file name, a document type, which I'm going to talk more about when I get into records management. And for this library, <clears throat> the site champions wanted to know the audience and fiscal year. These were the two critical metadata fields. Up at the top here, you have some other uh, neat tools like edit and grid tool. 
That allows you to easily apply metadata in bulk. You can export it to Excel, and I'll show you some other uh, other other buttons in a few screens here. And this is their key kind of information panel for the document. So if I select a document and hit that information panel, <clears throat> it slides out and it shows me contents of the document so I can preview the document without having to click on it and wait for it to open. It tells me who has access to it, and so I can actually manage that access right here. Uh, so I can invite visitors or, or members to edit this and share this content. And over here, it's showing me my properties, which are my file name and other metadata fields that I'm using for this document. If I scroll down a little bit further, it actually also shows me the activity for this document. So it says that Karen edited this file on August 19th. Then she actually moved it from a different library because she thought it was in the wrong place and then edited the file. And it's a PDF file with this information. So lots of useful information um, available in this information panel. A couple of buttons I wanted to point out because it's never been available until Office 365 is that if I select this file, I can move it to any other site or library very easily. It'll open up here in the right and I can navigate or copy it, which are two very useful features that users have been screaming out for for years. And Microsoft has uh, thankfully added it now to the new modern experience. So let's talk a little bit about the metadata. <coughs> the reason why metadata uh, CDIC chose to go with it over folders is that folders are typically created by users uh, sometimes they're really well thought through, sometimes they're not. Uh, and so folders and the way that libraries are organized or files are organized can mean something to one user, but maybe not be intuitive for anybody else. <clears throat> so it's very hard to know where to put things uh, or where to find things. And so what you end up with are more and more folders and more convenience copies because people aren't sure where things are. And the other thing with folders is that once you decide how to organize them, let's say you did think through your folder structure and you said, I'm going to create uh, folders by year and then in, or sorry, by vendor. And inside that vendor folder, I'm going to put my year and maybe inside that I'm going to put my quarters and I'm going to put my invoices. Well, that, based off of that structure, that's the only way that you can ever look at that, those documents. So you have no choice but to always go through by vendor, by year, by quarter. And if somebody said, hey, can you show me all the invoices for one quarter, you'd actually have to navigate through many different folders and kind of put together a package to get that. And that's where the beauty of metadata is, is that it's data and information about the document. And once you tag it, you can play with this view or how you want to see it any way you want it. So if I want to look at this information by fiscal year, I can click this arrow and say group by fiscal year. And then it'll automatically show me this within my library. And if I expand it, now I'm looking at the documents by fiscal year. And if I still have too many documents and I'm trying to find the one document that I'm looking for, then I can use something like filter by. So I can drop down audience, select filter by, it'll come up. I'll select risk committee, go ahead. And now you can see instead of staring at, you know, 20 or 30 files, I only have five files. So I have risk committee and the fiscal year and it's much easier to find it. And that's the great thing about metadata is that I can flip this around to any way I want. <clears throat> and I can save how I want to look at it in a view. And so for this library, users decided they want to group it by audience and then by fiscal year. And that's typically how they work with the files. Okay. How am I doing on time here? All right. <clears throat> so information management. One of the first tasks for the information management work stream was to describe the primary 365 applications and how they'll be used at CDIC. We also defined what not to use them for, information management controls, and governance that would be applied to each. In this table, you can see a clear distinction between SharePoint as the document management solution and Microsoft Teams, which will be leveraged for transitory collaboration. Files stored within Teams that have business value must be moved to a SharePoint site for records management. Teams will be disposed as part of their lifecycle management. The next step was to figure out how CDIC would implement records management. Out of box, Office 365 provides a field called retention label. Record managers can create the labels in a centralized location and push them out to specific sites so users can apply them to documents. This, however, would require the user to be familiar with labels and apply them consistently. 
This isn't difficult when the retention is based on when the document is created or last modified. However, it's unrealistic when you look at labels that should be applied after a date has passed or an event has occurred, such as a contract where the retention begins only after the contract has expired, or maybe a policy where the retention starts only after that policy is no longer active. This would require constant vigilance from your users to apply the label at the correct time, which in my opinion is not a realistic expectation. We therefore <clears throat> decided to leverage the auto labeling policies available in the Office 365 Compliance Center. These policies allow record managers to create rules that would apply the retention label automatically. And these rules are easy to create, however, require the correct metadata to handle the different retention scenarios. So in this example, the system will automatically apply the retention for all doc types that are equal contracts and the end date is less than today. So regardless of which site or library the document is stored, if the metadata matches these two conditions, then this retention label will be applied. For the auto labeling policies to work, we needed to identify the metadata required to drive the rules and we landed on a core metadata field that all documents must have when we called it document type and it is the base classification defining uh, what type of record each document is. <clears throat> document type can be manually or automatically applied depending on the library. If the library contains many different document types, then the user must tag each document when they create them. If the library contains only one document type, for an example, an invoices or contract library, then the system can auto populate this field. This is an example of how the document types map to CDIC's retention and disposition plan. Each of the document type tags directly relate to a specific retention. And we also identify keywords that might be familiar to users and added them as synonyms. To a user, they can enter any of the synonyms and the system will re replace it with the correct enterprise term. And this helps a lot with user adoption and training. With our records approach defined, our next challenge was to determine how the required metadata would get applied to documents. This is where content types come into play. Office 365 has a centralized site called the Enterprise Content Type Hub where organizations can define types of content and their metadata. The enterprise content types are pushed down to every site where they can be applied to libraries, ensuring metadata is applied consistently. So we started with a core content type called CDIC document. This content type defined core metadata that every document would have. It also became the parent for all other content types to ensure that this core metadata would be inherited or applied to the children. Our core metadata fields were document type, keywords, and language. As we onboarded departments, we also identified additional content types and their required metadata. These content types were made children of CDIC document to ensure that the core metadata would be inherited. And we also organize these content types into groups so that our administrator and the information governance team can ma easily maintain them. The child content types defined any additional metadata that was required either for retention, such as contracts and their end dates, or also metadata that was requested by the business to help organize their files. Building the sites and libraries, <clears throat> the content type is applied to the library and which will automatically add the correct metadata fields for retention and the organization of files. Content types are reusable and were often applied across different departments and libraries who are performing similar functions. We also indexed many of the common metadata fields so user can perform advanced searches and filters on metadata such as document type, vendors, fiscal year, and so on. All right, last part of this presentation is just to go over some critical success factors. Umar already touched on a few of them at the beginning, but I did want to talk about them uh, before we close off for a uh, question and answer period. So the first one was executive buy-in, and <clears throat> I can't uh, say how important this was. I, I, I've done similar projects at many organizations, 
And I often get into a place where uh, the organization agrees to do it and, and people understand why we want to do it. But when push comes to shove and, and you got to onboard the departments or work with various business resources, sometimes other projects or priorities uh, come first bef be before the information management or SharePoint migration project. And so by us getting executive buy-in at the beginning, getting the CEO as the project sponsor and running steering committee meetings where we're constantly showing off the cool things they can do in Office 365 and showing off our new sites and progress. It really got excitement and generated excitement across CDIC. And we found as we went into departments, we weren't facing resistance. In fact, people were saying, oh, I'm so happy that you're finally on us now because I, I, I couldn't wait to get this done. Excuse me. The other thing that which Umar touched on was a knowledgeable partner. Uh, I'm not going to expand on that right now, but I will touch on the fact that we have a supportive client. So Umar said that, you know, we really work together uh, as partners and, and didn't have this vendor client kind of relationship. And I have to say CDIC has been uh, my best client uh, over the past years. And the main reason being is that uh, they really listened uh, to the advice and we worked together. They didn't put up uh, too many roadblocks or too much scrutiny. Uh, on some of the items, we were able to to talk about it, make sense, document it, get approval, and then push it forward without very many uh, roadblocks. So very supportive client. We had that repeatable process, <clears throat> and we tested the repeatable process. And so we really were able to define timelines and roles and responsibilities. And so we didn't have a lot of meetings once we got going. We had this repeatable process. We had already tested in the pilot. So everybody from the records manager to the SharePoint administrator to, to myself and, and to the SharePoint PAs, we already knew exactly what was expected of us. And we were able to template our project plan and accurately tell departments when we are going to hit them. So uh, we had these different ways. So departments knew exactly when to expect us, how much time we needed from their resources. And it didn't require a lot of thinking or brainstorming or meetings, I should say, uh, once we got this repeatable process flowing. And the last point, of course, is change management. I'd say maybe a third to half of our budget was probably spent on change management. It was well worth it. Uh, we did a lot of custom training content, a lot of communications, and we received a lot of feedback from users saying uh, how amazing their go live and how the onboarding process and the launch was. And a lot of that had to do with our, our, with our change management. So, I've talked for almost 50 minutes here. I think I'm going to uh, open this up now to questions and answers. Sure, thank you very much. Really appreciate that, Ian. Good presentation with lots of good detail. Uh, really appreciate the questions coming in as well. So I'll ask some questions of you, Ian, and uh, we've published about eight questions. And uh, you know, it'd be great if you could uh, answer them as we go along. Do you have any metrics on uptake on the new SharePoint site and overall adoption of the Office 365 by employees? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's so, from Shelley. Yeah, it's, it's often hard to do. So we did a few things with the metrics. And <clears throat> as Umar said, we're not done the project yet. And so we are looking into getting certain metrics. But one thing we did is we did a baseline survey on user behaviors. And so before we entered any departments and onboarded, we did have a bunch of questions trying to understand where people are most likely to store their notes, where they're most like, how they're most likely to share files, so on and so forth. And so uh, we, we did the survey and got a bunch of respondents and that kind of formed a baseline for us. <clears throat> and now after groups are gone live and using it for a while, we want to run this survey again, maybe again in another six months and try to see just generally from kind of a softer perspective, how we're comparing against that user surveys. The other stats that we're looking at doing is trying to uh, look at email attachments and trying to see, OK, is that volume going down uh, or not? But as I was saying during my presentation, <coughs> we actually made the share drives and SharePoint 2010 sites read only. So to be honest, we kind of used a stick and a carrot here, right? They don't have another place to collaborate or put documents once we make it read only. They have no choice but to use SharePoint Online. And once we deploy Teams and move to Teams, you know, Skype for Business is taken down. So again, you know, our uptick is uptake is really high because these are the only tools and options that they have. Uh, I hope I answered that question. I don't know if anybody, if Umar or anybody else has, uh, wants to add on to that. 
Well, uh, Ian, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shelley, very much. And how many employees at CDIC, Ian? Uh, so CDIC is a Crown Corp. They have uh, just under 200 employees. I wouldn't. I would like to talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> uh, you know, when you first hear, uh, you know, 200 employees, you know, I'd immediately jump into, well, that's, you know, one of the reasons as to why you're successful, and it certainly is a factor. Uh, but I will say that even though CDIC is under 200 employees, as a company, they still do the same functions that larger companies do, right? They still have HR and finance and manage employee records and contracts and different functional areas. And so, <clears throat> uh, you know, they might, they, they still have the same complexities as large organizations. They just don't have the same volume. Now, that being said, because they're smaller, we were able to meet and onboard each department in roughly a year, right? So we have the advantage of having two SharePoint business analysts, and between the two of us, we were able to get through every single department with this repeatable methodology. So if I was to go into a larger organization, uh, you know, I'd want to look at this methodology and I have some different ideas uh, and some examples from, from past organizations as to how I would do this. So one is that you can use kind of a similar approach, but scale it out, right? And so you would kind of teach uh, uh, people how to fish. And so you would spend more time on the process, on the governance and guidelines, and training a network of people, of information managers or SharePoint champions, and teaching them how to onboard much the same as we did. And so it's kind of the exact same process. It's just scaled out for the large organization. Now, from my experience with organizations that are around five, 7,000 people and larger, you know, this process, <clears throat> you are looking at somewhere from, you know, two to five years has been my experience before you make it through all the departments. But you have to understand that at the end of the day, you're getting uh, customized sites built for that, that business group. So there's, they're not being forced, the template's not being forced on them, it's fully customized and the users love it because their libraries and metadata match exactly with what they try to do. So that's kind of like the Cadillac, right? And so there are kind of varying degrees of how you want to roll that out. Uh, other options might be that you start with some record types uh, that you have. Let's say your organization has 50 or 100 record types or 200, whatever it may be, contracts, invoices, briefing notes, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and you define those record types and the metadata needed to do retention. And then what you can do is you can go into each department almost like with a pick list and say, okay, which of these record types do you do? And tick them off <clears throat> and then you say, great, here's your template. Your site's ready to go in, in, in a week. Here's your new site with all those libraries and metadata and everything done for you. And then you can teach their site champions how to build the more transitory areas or maybe more custom areas to themselves and how to add met metadata. And so that, that's another repeatable methodology that you can kind of adopt in order to go out. You still have to identify all the document types, the record types you want and all the metadata and get the retention rules in place, but at least it gives you a repeatable process. You can rinse, wash and repeat and get through your departments. Uh, last, <laughs> two approaches I'll say to that comment is uh, another way is to instead of rolling out department by department if you had 30 departments and your plan is three years to onboard everybody you might be a little bit uh, unimpressed with the pro pro process that's made especially in the first year because that's where you're kind of running into new information types of metadata and defining some of your corporate taxonomy so the, the process is a little bit slower but you might say oh i only onboarded five departments or ten departments in one year and so if i have 30 departments you know i'm looking at five seven years for this this is crazy and so what you might want to do instead is focus on document types like briefing notes and and contracts and maybe take 10 or 20 tackle those first and then roll those out across your whole organization so now instead of just seeing one department using it or two you now have everybody up and running and getting familiar with it and trained and used to it uh, for those specific record types and then you can just pick away at adding more and more record types uh, yeah and the last thing sorry just one comment i want to talk about ai so <clears throat> this presentation and, and what i talked about for information management you might have noticed that I'm looking for the user to tag with the document type and metadata or if it's in a specific library, we can auto populate those tags. Uh, you know, that's still 
fairly heavy lifting. You don't want to have too many pieces of metadata. I think any more than two uh, and your users just get tired and they just don't want to upload and tag things. And so some of the ideas that Orangutac has been putting in place and is currently working on right now with uh, another client is an artificial intelligence tool that can crawl through the content, looking, picking out keywords, picking out uh, trends. Uh, also, if you had a templated document, uh, it can pick out certain metadata fields and dates and start auto-populating that for users. So users at this point can just work however they want to. They can just create whatever libraries and metadata, put their files up, still use folders if they want. And then this tool would go ahead and start populating that key metadata that you need automatically, and then that would drive your retention rules. Okay, I'll hey, stop there. Thank you. Thank you, and <laughs> really appreciate that. Thank you. And we'll definitely at some point have a discussion around Tag AI, one of our products, as he's mentioned. Um, here's a great question, and I can answer it from Sunny. Would the session recording slides be available? We will send out the slides. And please, if you don't hear from Colleen, say by Monday, then ask. We'll make sure we'll get them out. Uh, the only slide we'll probably not include is the repeatable process. It's intellectual property. Uh, we'll just put the words repeatable process. Uh, but it's certainly intellectual property, so appreciate that. But everything else we will will include in the presentation. So really appreciate the questions. Um, from Sunny as well, Ian, any third-party tools used for the CDIC intranet using SharePoint Online? Uh, the only tool we were looking at uh, was Pointfire for translation. And like Microsoft and cloud services typically happen, you 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 purchase a tool and, and you get it up and you're ready to use it. We're using it for French. And then Microsoft launched its out of box new translation approach. And luckily we weren't live yet. And so we took a look at it and we really liked how Microsoft was doing new modern uh, internet pages for French for bilingual content. And so we ended up uh, abandoning uh, our, our, our translation tool and then going with out of the box. For forms and workflows, uh, we are using uh, Power Apps and Flow, uh, and we are using Microsoft Forms. Now, the only thing with Microsoft Forms is that the only data center is in the States, and so we have to be careful when we're, when we're creating forms or surveys or polls or anything using that tool to make sure if there's no protected A or protected B, it can only be used for public content. Uh, but the other apps are, are hosted in the Canadian data center. Uh, I will say that the Power Apps, it was mostly meant for mobile and tablet. And although you can change forms and embed it onto pages, uh, we've had to be a little creative in how we're creating our forms uh, within within Power Apps. I think CDIC might be considering Mintex maybe in the future if they start adding more forms and more workflows and more complex workflows. Super, thank you. And from Sunny again, is OneDrive and Office for the web enabled for end users? Did you also do an upgrade to desktop Office Suite? Yes, yeah, so all of CDSE users are on Windows 10. They're using Office Pro Plus desktop, which is fully integrated with their Office 365 tenant. They're, all of their users are in Azure AD. And so it all works beautifully. Uh, we did not restrict access on mobile apps or anything like that. Instead, we opted to, to put in multi-factor authentication. So if, if employees aren't signing from their work computer or, or uh, VPN, <clears throat> then, then they are able to log in, but they must MFA. Uh, we expire their session after 24 hours. So they're, they're forced to re-authenticate every 24 hours. And so in doing these types of security controls, plus the sensitivity labels that I went over for protected B content, we felt confident in kind of just opening up uh, the toolkit and the native apps that come uh, with Office 365 and the thick clients for, for users' desktops. Super, I've got a, um, a question from Maureen at Justice. I'd be very interested how you manage the change management of moving employees to working in the hubs, basically cross-functional suites. Sites, sorry, cross-functional sites. Oh yes, the cross one, right. <clears throat> um, <laughs> that actually is still ongoing. So the contracts portal is almost ready for launch. And so our change manager extraordinaire, Mark Dablinor, uh, I haven't seen his uh, quick reference cards or health guides on what he's gonna do for it. 
I know I've seen a couple of them, which is mainly around the search. Uh, so contracts, as you can imagine, have a lot of metadata fields, such as uh, uh, PO number and, and M uh, MSA number and all types of things like that, vendor. Uh, so I know we are indexing it uh, so that users can quickly search if they happen to know the vendor or, or uh, PO number or master service agreement that is related to. <clears throat> Other than that, we, we've created some views in the navigation to help drive user adoption. Uh, but to be honest, I, I, I have to cop out a little bit on this answer because those materials are not produced yet and I haven't seen them. Uh, but I know that, that we do have them. Thanks, Ian. Um, what is the timeline to move the whole organization to SharePoint online? Yeah, so we uh, plan on being done uh, just slightly after Christmas. So 90% of the organization will be 100% done in December. So we're in October right now. Uh, as Umar said, about half the organization is live. And I'd say, a uh, you know, a third of the organization has already started the, the process and they're in various stages. Some of them are in migration. Some of them are about to get training and go live. Um, and then the rest of the groups will be live uh, by the second week of December. There's one group that we did have to push uh, past December simply because they had a blackout period that wouldn't let us. So the whole organization will be live end of January uh, on SharePoint Online. Super. I think we may have covered all the questions. I mean, I know you're saying, so there is one other question asking around, is it bilingual? And you've kind of answered that question. Not yeah. Is it <clears throat> yeah, so the internet site, uh, any forms, uh, any of the critical content that needs to be bilingual is absolutely bilingual. We always check with our people and culture group uh, to make sure that we're compliant. Uh, we support, if you remember, one of the core metadata fields that I pointed out was language. And so when you create a document <coughs> that defaults to English as a tag, but if you're creating a document in French, you can tag it as French and then filter and search on those contents. So in the, in the document management areas, uh, you know, Microsoft has uh, a multiple uh, language user interface, they call it MUI. So if you change your browser setting or, or personal language setting in your profile, it will show the out of box buttons and interface in French. But some of the content within the document management sites might not be totally French, like document names and some of the custom metadata, depending on the type of metadata. But the internet and the forums and enterprise resources, they, they are all 100% uh, bilingual. Super. There's been a couple of excellent questions from Wayne Wheeler at PSPC, and we've sort of lost them, Wayne. I apologize. Uh, we will, and I've got your email address. I will reach out to you. Both uh, Microsoft would have the opportunity to answer those questions for you. So very good questions. Apologize that we uh, don't have them live at the moment. Any last questions? I think we've covered all, all the questions that have come out. Really want to thank CDIC, Ian Taylor, and o Omar. Really appreciate it. Omar Watt, thank you so much for your presentations and uh, for allowing us to do this. As I mentioned, we will have a D&D &D session uh, of the Council at the end of October. We always have Microsoft on board to answer and should there ever be any concerns. So Jan Cox, and Michael Wright, thank you both for being there. For everybody, thank you for dialing in and uh, appreciate all your help. And we'll talk to everybody later within the mo next month. Looking forward to it at the end of October. Thank you so much. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.